In the 1900 years, reports had provided varying details about the discovery that Sir Harry Johnston had the good fortune to make of a large ruminant, hitherto unknown. It inhabits the forests bordering the Semliki River in Central Africa, south of Lake Albert, on the border of Uganda and the Congo. Here is the story of this discovery in a nutshell. The explorer Sir Harry Johnston was in 1882 to 1883 a guest of Stanley, at Stanley Pool on the Congo. At that time, he was visiting the Congo partly as an explorer and mostly as a naturalist. Stanley, while discussing the possibilities of discoveries in Africa, mentioned that he believed that everything astonishing that tropical Africa could possess must be grouped in the region of the Blue Mountains south of Lake Albert Nyanza. This opinion of Stanley's was undoubtedly one of the reasons that drove him to the aid of Emin Pasha. His journey through the vast Congo forest to the Blue Mountains resulted in the discovery of the largest chain of snow-covered mountains in Africa, the Rwenzori, which is part of the Blue Mountains, the Semliki River, constituting the upper course of the Nile, Lake Albert Edward, from which this river escapes to flow at the foot of the Rwenzori and many other interesting things, including details much more comprehensive than those they had on the pygmies of the northern forests of the Congo. Stanley was the first to draw the world's attention to the impenetrable and formidable nature of these powerful forests and to allude to the mysteries and wonders they can offer naturalists. The considerable difficulties encountered by his expedition prevented him and his companions from paying much attention to natural history. It should be added that explorers are compelled to quickly traverse the tangle of these forests, making it very difficult for them to make effective contact with the life forms that inhabit them. Stanley and Harry discussed these matters upon their return from Uganda. Stanley declared to him that he believed the Okapi to be just one of many new and strange beasts that would eventually be discovered in these intriguing forests. He added that he had glimpsed a sort of gigantic pig nearly two meters long, and some antelopes of an absolutely unknown type. As for the Okapi, which interested them, the only indication regarding its existence that he gathered was that the pygmies were aware of an animal, a denizen of these forests, which bore much resemblance to a donkey and which they trapped in pits. Harry found this very brief indication, appended in Stanley's book, In Darkest Africa, intriguing some time before his departure for Uganda. It seemed so extraordinary to him that a creature resembling a horse could inhabit a dense forest that he resolved, if chance ever led him in that direction, to dedicate himself to its investigation. Immediately upon reaching Uganda at the end of 1899, Harry came into contact with a significant group of pygmies who had been abducted by an overzealous German impresario, intending to exhibit them at the 1900 Paris Exposition. Taking advantage of Belgian opposition to this approach, he wrested the pygmies from the impresario's hands and kept them with him for a few months in Uganda until he was personally able to escort them back to their retreats in the Congo forest. Harry had other reasons of interest to his government to visit the northwest region of the Congo. As soon as he could communicate with the pygmies through an interpreter, he questioned them about the existence of this horse-like animal living in their forests. They immediately understood what he meant and pointing to a zebra skin and a live mule, they informed him that the creature in question, called the Okapi, resembled a mule adorned with zebra stripes. Upon reaching Fort Mbini in the Congo on the west bank of the Semliki River, he inquired with the Belgian officers stationed there. They all knew of the Okapi, albeit only dead. They had never seen the animal alive, but their indigenous soldiers used to hunt it in the forest and kill it with spears, bringing back the skin and meat for the fort's use. One of the officers even claimed that a fresh skin could still be found near the fort. They immediately searched for it and discovered most of it, which had been abandoned. Only the most visible parts had been cut by the soldiers to make straps. Harry sent these scraps to England along with others he obtained from the forest natives to submit them for examination by Professor Sclater. The Belgian officers provided him with guides, and he took all the pygmies he had brought from Uganda and entered the forest. 
He spent several days searching for the Okapi. Throughout this time, he remained convinced that he was on the trail of some kind of horse, which is why when the natives showed them tracks of a cloven-hoofed animal like an elk and told them these were the tracks of the Okapi, Harry refused to believe them, imagining they were simply following a forest elk. They never saw the Okapi, as the stay in the forest made the whole expedition sick, and Harry's official mission called him elsewhere, so he had to abandon this search. However, he had learned from the natives that the Okapi was a defenseless animal, the size of a large antelope or a mule, which only inhabited the densest part of the forest, with males and females generally roaming together. The Okapi was reputedly mainly a leaf-eater. The Belgian officers, seeing that Harry was disappointed not to be able to take away a complete skin, kindly promised to do their utmost to obtain one for him, which they would send to him in Uganda after his departure. This promise was fulfilled by Mr. Carl Eriksson, a Swedish officer in the service of Belgium. Mr. Erickson sent him a complete skin and two skulls. The skin and the larger of the two skulls had belonged to a young male. With this skin, they reconstructed the Okapi, which is now displayed in the South Kessington Natural History Museum. When Harry received Mr. Erickson's shipment, he immediately realized what the Okapi was, particularly its close relationship with the giraffe. The slight development of the horn bumps led him to believe that the Okapi was closer to the Helidotherium than to the present giraffe. By sending these two skulls and this skin to Professor Ray Lancaster, Harry proposed to him to call the animal the Helidotherium tigrinum. Professor Lancaster, after examining the specimens in the light of knowledge superior to his own, concluded that the Okapi was a much closer relative of the giraffe than of the Helidotherium but it possessed enough unique characteristics to compel him to create a new genus, which he proposed to call Okapia. As for the scraps of skin collected upon his arrival at Fort Mbini, which had been the subject of his first shipment, these scraps obviously belonged to an older and more developed animal than the mounted specimen displayed in the museum. According to experts, they had initially been considered to come from the skin of an unknown species of horse. This supposed new horse had been provisionally named by Professor Sclater Equus Johns Tony. Professor Lancaster, when faced with the complete skin, had to abandon any idea of a relationship between the Okapi and the horse. He then kindly added the specific name Johns Tony, suggested by Professor Sclater, to the genus Okapia that he had just established. At that time, they knew little more about this extraordinary inhabitant of the Congo forests, the sole living relative of the giraffe. Paleontological discoveries made in Europe and Asia had taught them that there existed a large family of ruminants, which, in their development and characteristics, were neither bovids nor cervids, but which in several respects occupied a position halfway between these two families of horned ungulagrade ruminants, the giraffe, the okapi, the samotherium, Civitherium and Bramatherium belong to this family. It is highly probable that bony prominences emerged from the skulls of these animals, somewhat similar to the frontal processes that support the horns of cattle. From the tips of these prominences, they seem to have formerly developed horns, probably deciduous like those of the pronghorn. Over time, being such as the giraffe lost any need for offensive weapons and ceased to develop horns, but the processes from which the horns once detached remained. This is still the case today for the giraffe. In the Okapi, these bony processes have been reduced to simple bumps. In 1919, the Antwerp Zoo in Belgium welcomed the first captive Okapi, marking a historic moment in zoo history. The arrival of this elusive forest dweller captured the imagination of visitors, who marveled at its unique appearance. As the first zoo in the world to exhibit an okapi, the Antwerp Zoo played a crucial role in introducing this species to a wider audience. Crowds flocked to see the mysterious creature, with its striped legs and giraffe-like neck, 
housed in a carefully designed enclosure reminiscent of its natural habitat in the Congo rainforest. The addition of the okapi to the zoo's collection provided researchers and conservationists with invaluable opportunities to study and protect this endangered species. Even today, the okapi remains one of the least understood wild mammals, both by zoologists and by those who still hunt them in the equatorial forests of the Congo. Pygmies are certainly the best informed people about the habits of this animal, as they capture it for consumption. This nocturnal and solitary herbivore exclusively inhabits the impenetrable forests of Wele and Aruwimi Aturi, which is why its existence was discovered relatively late compared to other animals of similar size. Its cautious, even timid nature, combined with an inaccessible and dangerous environment for humans, has allowed the animal to remain a closely guarded secret by the only humans capable of adapting to these forests. This species is so elusive that two zoologists, James Chapin and Hubert Lang, were unable to capture a living specimen during their successful Congo expedition in 1913, despite being familiar with it for a good 10 years and its distribution range being fairly localized. According to the Bambuti pygmies, the female gives birth to a calf in the middle of the rainy season, between August and October, the time when the forest fills with young shoots. Those in captivity in zoos are fond of salads and tend to be quite calm with the people caring for them. To feed, the okapi wraps its long, bluish, prehensile tongue around leaves and buds to draw them into its mouth. The tongue also serves for hygiene, reaching into its ears and in females for cleaning the calf. <laughs>